hardly believe it. He has found treasure. It covers it up <coughs> and keeps it secret. He sells everything that he owns. To get enough money to go and buy that thing.
today, and so we really just want to, to pick up on that. Uh, it's always difficult to follow the children, so I'm not going to try. I'm going to ask Martin to do it. So. <laughs>
Team 5 is on the road to speak about the Holy Spirit to the youth group. And I thought, wow, I thought, you know, I said to, to Brian, are you sure you've got the right person? He said, oh yeah, we've prayed about it, we want you to do it. This song is about the man, that certain man who entered the room, that Jericho. I wanted to sing a song first of all because I realised my house party, there's always about half a dozen people, perhaps more, who've been sitting there all weekend thinking, I really feel out of this. I really don't feel a part of this. I feel awful.
Yeah, you don't believe that. I think they're more needy than others sometimes. The verse that's really on my heart, that the Lord's laying on my heart at the moment, it's two really, two verses. Sow with yourselves righteousness. Reap the fruit of unfailing love. And break up your unplowed ground. It's time to seek the Lord until he comes and shouts righteousness on you. And I feel since Christmas time that the Lord is saying, Martin, when you plow up your ministry, really plow through what I'm plow through your life. I don't know if you know that very often um, in geography lesson that in Holland uh, they have what's called an iron plant. It's just, just water rain. It's washes still all the sort of uh, iron uh, compounds in it. And it forms a sort of iron pan. And it produces very unfertile ground. And that's a deep plow. A huge plow. It's a five foot deep plow. So huge furrows. I feel as though the Lord wants to do it in my life. I want to be more fruit and fruit. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. John 12. People at school, people in colleges where I go, people in churches where I go, I'm still convinced that the various churches, particularly in Bromley, seem to be asking me to take services. I'm really amazed at that. Sir, we like to see Jesus. And Jesus replies, the hour has come, the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. It's the man who loves his life and loses it, or the man who hates his life in this world and keeps it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. My father will be the one who serves me. He finishes that verse by saying, But I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. If I had one vision for my ministry, I want to do that. I want to draw people to Jesus. I know he does it by his spirit. I know he does that. But I want to have a ministry that draws people to him. Whether they know him or whether they don't. You know, drawing people to him. This is based on Psalm 139. Look into my heart. See if I'm worried too much. See if there be anything that offends you in me. You see into my deepest thoughts. Well, before I speak my mind, how precious towards me are your thoughts. In your life, Yeah.
going on for 20 years since I first met Martin. And um, we actually met in a, a home in Worthing where I'd been taken to a, a home group meeting the first time I'd ever been to a house church. And uh, Martin was uh, at Worthing High School at the time. And God had done a tremendous work amongst many of those Worthing High School students. And uh, just going into the room that night, I found that my whole Christian life was turned upside down. Marion and I were provisionally accepted to, to go to the mission field. And I went into that room. I'd been doing church-based youth work for about five, six years. We had all kinds of problems. I was working amongst a lot of the uh, mods and rockers groups in Brighton at the time when all those riots, you may remember, every Easter Monday it was horrendous. Uh, I've run youth clubs where uh, they used to find out where the main switches were and the chairs would get thrown. And, uh, a plenty of experience like that. And we saw some move of the Spirit of God amongst those youngsters in that youth group. I remember one night, it was almost impossible to know what to do with them. And uh, we'd uh, said to someone, someone had said to me, perhaps you want to show them one of those uh, uh, <coughs> films, you know, the, uh, what are they called? Those, those things where all the science bit in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> And the Fact and Faith films in Brighton were run by, some of you might know Dave Fanston, who runs Open Air Campaign as well. Dave's dad was Wing Commander Fanstone, DOC and Bar. And uh, he used to run the Fact and Faith films. And uh, he, he, he always turned up with the equipment of his films. And he came one night, and I think he was showing something from City of Bees. And uh, he started the project, and he got all these kids in this room. And they weren't the least bit interested in the film at all. And the wing commander had turned in the film and cut me up in front saying, You're naughty, John, if you don't listen to this film, I have to take it all off. You know, we can have all of these in He obviously hasn't done much youth work recently, as the wing commander And the incredible thing was they were so bored with all the, the science bit at the front. It was absolutely normal. And you know that bit which turns most people off when this chap goes and gets the Bible off the shelf, he sees it, he puts it down, and then he starts it. Well, at that point, most people fall asleep, but at that point, they all went quiet and listened. And at the end of it all, I said, does anyone want to respond to what he said? And we prayed for 30 kids that night. <laughs> <laughs> and the poor wing commander wrote to his name and said, this was the naughtiest, naughtiest group of children I've ever shown a film to. And 30 of them responded to the message. <laughs> <laughs> but the big problem I faced then, that 30 kids that had responded to the Lord, was really how to take one in the church, which was so dead. It was just impossible. And I broke my heart with those kids, and I still do. There are some of them that now and then I just think of them, they just breaks me up. And, um, oh, we tried everything. Um, yeah, we tried running things parallel to the church and trying to get them going. Um, but then I went to this meeting in Worthing, and there was just such fantastic liberty in the spirit amongst those kids from that school. And uh, I just came away from that and said, Lord, I want at some point in my life to see a church that anyone can come into and feel totally at home. Whether they're kids off the street, you know, whether they've been, you know, sleeping rough on the beach in Brighton, or it was in the early days of football hooliganism as well. They used to come in from the, the Brighton matches and I used to say, we won, and they said, we did, we did not slash the other, not bad, up around the back of the terraces, you know. And I used to say, what was the score of the match? I said, we haven't got a clue, we didn't even point to you know. But some of them really were responding to the Lord. And, and so I wanted to see a church, and I still do, and I still don't feel we're there yet, where people can come in, and, and God is just so present. And I just remember being in that, that room, and I remember meeting Martin that night, and uh, sometime after Mary and I were at a conference in the West Country, and, and that group was there again, and we invited Martin and a friend back to stay in our little masonette that we rented in Plumstead. And uh, I just remember praying for Martin that weekend, and uh, I remember him praying for me as well. And he said something to me, he said, I believe God's going to give you a church. And uh, I laughed. <laughs> I don't know, made you think that. I thought, 
no, no real expectation in that way at all. And I just remember what he said, he said, because you care. Now, I didn't feel particularly worthy of that comment then, and I don't now. But at that point, God began something. Martin went off to Nottingham and did his teacher training. We lost touch, and he did a year's research up there at Trent Polytechnic, and then got this job in Bromley and um, at um, Kelsey Park. And really, that was uh, when we met up again after quite a long break. And <coughs> since then, it's, it's been really great to, to be able to work with Martin in all kinds of situations. And one thing I found, particularly strange enough, the last student mission I did, which I anticipate will probably the last one I ever did, I'm not expecting it all to, to keep on taking in the rounds of the colleges. And I've done four or five student missions, I think it's more than that. But the last one I did was a big one at King's College and it was just so good to have Martin there. We were working on about four or five campus sites and uh, I found that uh, it didn't matter what the group was or the situation we faced, that you could put Martin in and sing, so just sing a song. And somehow God had moved and it was just possible to preach on the back of it. And uh, that, that's, that's something really special and I'm praising God for that. I want us to turn to Luke 11 just for a little while. It won't be a long time. I now have quite a long list of people who want to see me before we go back to Bromley. We mustn't make this session too long unless the Lord meets all the, uh, all the needs before we finish. You know. It's the sort of people I need to see before and around lunchtime. This is, of course, the passage of Scripture which contains the Lord's Prayer. And I know those of you who were brought me sound by the Christmas had uh, the opportunity to have a lot of ministry on this. George, and uh, I would thoroughly endorse that ministry. Uh, I know the roots of it, where it comes from, and I just believe that it's of God that we really look at these things and see them together. I learned to pray this prayer as they would have prayed it in the beginning. But I'm not going to repeat anything like those messages this morning. I'm just going to focus on one little aspect of this. One day when Jesus was praying in a certain place, he finished and one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples and he said to them, where do you pray? So, that's it, I'm not going to go into the prayer. So, because it's such a short bit, I'll read it again. <laughs> one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say. The pattern in those days was very much that leaders taught disciples. We talked about discipleship a little bit <coughs> last night. So we were saying that Really, if you were someone's disciple, the whole focus of your life was to follow that person, to get to know them inside out, to assimilate everything that they could give you, to, to get inside their personality, to try and copy them, so that, you know, when people met you, they know immediately whose disciple you were. And this used to happen in the ancient world. You could tell who you followed by the way you spoke, what you wore, and it was just that, that obvious. Perhaps it was something to do with the Eastern mind that was much freer of some of the strong individualism that characterizes us. Um, you've got to realize that the cradle of the gospel is a society that was much more committed to community than we are. They actually thought about family. They thought about the common good. Their immediate reaction was, what's in this for me? But they actually tend to think, how's this going to affect us? <laughs> and they, they didn't mind uh, actually having these people 
who they end up being like because they weren't so much into this individuality thing in that kind of way that some of us are. Now, when Jesus gathered around himself a group of disciples, one of the interesting things he did was to give them individual identity. When so many other people talk about their disciples, it was just like a block, you know, my disciples. But with Jesus, it was Peter and James and John. And they were all individuals. And it seems that the incredible thing that Jesus was doing in his ministry was bringing out their individuality. Sometimes in quite provocative ways. I mean, look at the incredible thing that happened in the upper room. He said to Peter and to the disciples, when the question came up about swords, when they were going out, do you remember the incident? He actually encouraged, it was Jesus who encouraged Peter to take the sword. I thought much about where he might have got it from. But it was a provocation. I know what kind of person you are, Peter. You're a wild man. You love to get out there and start whacking around. And, and, and you love me so much, Peter, that you want to be in control and you want to take charge and you want to fight on all covers. And it was provocative of Jesus to suggest that Peter took a sword. And of course, when they got to the garden, guess how many people used the sword? And off came someone's ear. And I had an American preacher once who was preaching on this, and he was getting really carried away. And he said, And Peter struck out, and he cut off the serpent's ear, and Jesus bent down and he picked up the ear, and he. I've never thought of it like that before. <laughs> before Jesus reached out and healed him, you know. Perhaps the ear was left on the ground, and he was 70, but I never, <laughs> I never thought about it like that. Preachers have got wonderful imagination. They give you insights into the world that you never ever thought about. <laughs> but the lesson that came home to Peter after that was such a big self-discovery. Because Jesus said to him, those who live by the sword, Peter will die by the sword. Now if that had just been talked about in some classroom situation, Peter would have just nodded and said, oh yes, I believe that. But because he'd been taken out to find out what he was really like, and he saw that he was someone who just loved walking around with a sword, that then when Jesus said it, it hit him. It was a moment of self-discovery for him. And Jesus seemed to lead each of those disciples into moments of self-discovery. Look at Thomas. I think Jesus deliberately chose a moment to appear to his disciples when Thomas wasn't there. So that Thomas could discover the doubt that he was. Because it was in his makeup. <coughs> he was a doubter. And some people had things in their makeup. I've told this story before. When I started working in dental practice in Bethany, my predecessor had written so many comments on the patient's cards to sum up their character. We could no longer give them cards to the patients to carry out the reception area. And <laughs> they were very, very revealing. It was most helpful for me because I sort of work out exactly what I was going to face. And one day I saw this incredible comment on the car, which just said, a suspicious patient. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, whatever's a suspicious patient? And this chap comes in the door like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, just sit in the chair, please. <laughs> and he tests it. <laughs> Come out so that God can use each one of us 
in the way that he's made us. Because in that, we, we, we discover so much more worth as a church. And it will be strong. But as these people were being discipled, not only did they pick up the examples of the behaviour patterns and accept those into their lives, but they would also try and draw out as much teaching. Teach us this, teach us that, tell us about the other. But they would put these things into practice in their lives very rigorously. Perhaps it will help you understand just how strong the discipling principle was when you look at that verse in the Acts when the disciples were described and it was said that you could tell that they'd been with Jesus. Yeah. Now of course we, we spiritualise that. Well, fair enough, you know, I hope people can tell that we've been with Jesus. Hope our lives have changed because we spent time worshipping this morning and we've been with Jesus. And, and don't just think that being with Jesus means having a little time of quiet on your own. I don't know, I'm just, it's funny. You can have a wonderful time of worship together with the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you missed out on your quiet time and someone came up and said, you spent any time with the Lord today? So, no, I'm so sorry, I don't But what were you doing with the praise and worship time if you weren't spending time with the Lord? You know, we, we think so narrowly, don't we? I've had a tremendous time with the Lord this morning. Um, I missed out on most of my uh, opportunity for quiet time, so I went for a run with Neil, but never mind, that was good. But I believe that that's, that, was, that was right, I wanted to do that. But I had a tremendous time of prayer when we came into the prayer meeting this morning. And you know, I find that God blesses me and ministers me, sometimes on my own, sometimes with other people. But it doesn't make any difference, it's time with the Lord. Whether it's time with the Lord on your own, or time with the Lord with others. And I hope that we all know this morning that we've been with Jesus. Perhaps individually, but certainly corporately. But it was more than that. It wasn't just a spiritual state. Oh, you could see that we've been with Jesus. But they were like Jesus. They probably talked to you like Jesus. They picked up his mannerisms. And I know we sometimes rebel against this. But don't rebel too hard, because if you do, you'll, you'll waste so much energy. It's inevitable that you'll get a bit like the people that you're with. Maybe that ought to make you choosy about the people that you go around with. But you will. You'll end up praying like people who need a bromley sound. Unfortunately. Now you might start off praying one morning and you might think, Oh Lord. No, goodness, I can't say that. That sounds like George Forrester. We do love you, Lord. No, I can't say that. That sounds like Rich Williams. Um, you can end up actually just setting your prayer life out so that you don't communicate because you're so afraid of sounding like someone else and you want to be individual. <coughs> you will never pray a totally individualistic prayer. You will never manage it. Because I can be pretty sure that at least some of the words you strung together have been strung together by someone else before. And you'll never manage to pray in a completely individualistic tone. I mean, everyone that brought this out might pray, oh, Jesus. You know, the way something like very long, oh, you know where they come from. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the individualists might say, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say, oh, Jesus. <laughs> but I'm sure that some church in Africa has always pray, oh, Jesus, you know. So you're not going to be totally individualistic. But what does it matter? What does it matter? We're disciples. And we're together. And there'll be things that mark us out as being together. And that's what happened. They weren't making great spirit. We can tell you've been with Jesus. <laughs> we can tell by, by the way you pick this up and the way that you pick that up. It says about the uh, little flock assemblies that uh, Watch With Me started out in China. And they all had a way when they were praying, they just prayed, Oh Lord, we do thank you, Lord. And they just prayed like that. <laughs> and one missionary realised they prayed like that because Watch Me prayed like that. <laughs> and they all thought it was very spiritual, but the problem was evidently Watch Me had a rather badly fitting up attention. <laughs> and he did have that mannerism in his spirit. And everyone else picked it up as well. <laughs> Any less. And I would rather have a whole congregation of clickers <laughs> than people who can't pray freely because they're trying to avoid the clicks. <laughs> in the end, you just want to express yourself in what way comes naturally, and if you 
picked up mannerisms and habits, you're not going to be free of them. And you just have to let it go. And just allow yourself to, 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 to be in the hands of God so He can draw out the really individual things that matter. Because otherwise we'll end up, you know, straining at gnats and swallowing camels. And ending up with a rebellious spirit if we're not careful. And blocking things that God wants to do. Communication is very limited. You know, in some parts of the, the uh, culture strand that's this country, you know, it is. We, we, such a divide. I think one of the most helpful ways I've seen uh, society divided up recently is into what is described as a reading and a non-reading culture. Have you ever thought about it like this? There are people who love to read books and there are people who don't. Now I realise you can always divide the world into two types of people. You must have heard that thing where someone said you can divide the world into two types of people. Those who divide the world into two types of people and those who don't. That's um, <laughs> true. You know, people always say that. No, there are always two types of people. There are everything. But certainly in this country there are very great distinctions between a reading culture and a non-reading culture. And one of the problems is that most of the ministry in this country is being delivered by people who come from a reading culture to congregations that come from a non-reading culture. They grasped this one last year at Spring Harvest and they actually divided people into groups according to the newspapers that they read. And they realised that you speak to someone who reads The Sun <laughs> rather differently from the way you speak to someone who reads The Independent. The only problem was that when they got all the speakers together, they didn't actually find one that read the sun, but they did say <laughs> they did say to us that you're going to have to communicate this year at cultural levels. And if you're going to speak to a group of people who gather together because they like to read the Daily Mail rather than the Independent or the Times or the FT, there was even a special group for that. <laughs> As people who just saw everything in, in rose colour. <laughs> You are to read that newspaper day after day for weeks before you turn up to teach at Spring Harvest so that you get into the culture of that which you're going to teach. I was telling you, I wonder which one I got. <laughs> but there was one stream that wasn't done by newspapers. It was called um, was it Training Leaders. I think that was what I was talking about. Something like that. All those inspiring leaders were one. He wasn't actually communicating at the pink page level. 
I don't think he spoke at a level that was particularly for the Times readers, or for those who prefer the Independent. He spoke at a level that everyone could understand. And you know the truth is that the lower you go, the more people there are that understand you. But the trouble is that at the top end of the scale, there are a lot of people who despise it. And that's the problem. And you know, the ministry of Jesus, in the end, was taught, it was communicated in such simple ways that everyone, if they were humble enough, would understand it. This is why it says of Jesus, the common people heard it gladly. He didn't talk like the Pharisees. They were trying to impress everyone all the time. He came out with stories. They loved it and they understood. And really, to be a disciple of Jesus, we've got to be willing to take on some of these things, some of these characteristics, to, to come down from our high points where we're not prepared to do this and we're not prepared to do that and we want to express our individuality in this way. And if we're going to be a Christian, we're going to be this kind of Christian. And if we're not careful, we'll shut the world out. We'll be the same kind of church in all our liveliness as that church I spoke about when I was leaving the youth work in all its things. We will be just as irrelevant. Oh, people are coming and saying, oh, I can see they've got something that's really alive. But they can still find it totally alien to their own experience. And we've really got to pray that if we're really open to the Spirit of God, I believe that God by His Spirit will always produce culturally relevant Christians. Because the Holy Spirit actually is interested in the whole business of communicating with people. But if we get it all caught up and we're letting our pride get in and we're trying to be something all polished and posh, God deliver us from it. And set us free to be an army of ordinary people, is that cause? I love that. I said we will be ordinary people that can talk to ordinary people and uh, and see ordinary people saved and, and, and to set the spiritual goals where Jesus sets the spiritual goals right? trying to make people sort of climb in the fourth floor window instead of walking the front door it's done isn't it I remember we went through a particularly uh, arrogant time as a church once at uh, Bromley we've been through all sorts of things but churches do go through this and some churches never realise they're in the middle of it. That's when there's a big problem. Praise God, we suddenly realised what we were doing. Someone came in one day and said to me, I think this is the kind of church you'd have to join second. You know, after you'd served your apprenticeship somewhere else. And I thought, Lord, I don't want to be that kind of church. You know, a church for high flyers, the spiritual elite, the place where you come once you've had the corners knocked off you and you can understand the language of this and Lord, deliver us. Who wants to be like that? You know, when you've served your apprenticeship, you've learned to pray the little prayers, go to a church where they pray long ones. You know, when you've been to a church where they, they sing little choruses which you can understand, go to a church which sings hymns in ancient languages that you know. By Wesley. <laughs> Most of us are cluttered up 
What are they thinking now? How am I coming across? How do I do it? Why does it matter? <laughs> the only thing you don't want to do is to present a something block to other people. But too much preening and priding and checking and am I doing all right now can be the greatest stumbling block of all the other people. In trying so hard to ensure they don't see you, but they see Jesus, you can be so concentrating on you that they only see you. God deliver us from that. I know preachers that are absolutely scared of personality. I'm really trying very hard not to let my personality come across, they say. They are some of the most awkward people to sit and listen to you will ever find in your life. But God has given us a personality. The important thing is that our personalities come under the control of the Holy Spirit and imbued by the Holy Spirit. You cannot lead without personality. Personality is part of God's way in which you lead. We've got to let the Lord work through us. And it will only happen as we lose that awful, awful, awful self-consciousness. <clears throat> it's the cross that we need to deal with our self-consciousness. And you do realise that Jesus was living a crucified life ever before he got to the cross. His whole life was a crucified life. It was a life that was not I, not I, not I. Every day it was not I. He never went to his disciples saying, how did I come across this? Did I say that all right? You might say, well, he didn't need to. And I don't mind us submitting to one another in love. But this groping around for, for, for bolstering up our ego, I'm just sure it's not. And Jesus was completely free of that awful self-consciousness. You see, Jesus was praying, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Where do you think he was praying? Well, not very far from where they could see him. I know that um, he taught in the Sermon on the Mount, when you pray, you go in the room, you shut the door, you're there, you're in the farm. And that's good. But there were certainly times in his own life where he just prayed right in the middle. You think when they came back after you'd sent them out on that mission of the twelve, they come back so excited, we've seen this happen, we've seen that happen. And it says, at that moment, he rejoiced in his spirit. He said, Father, I thank you that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent, and that you've shown them babes. Well, they all heard it. You know they did because they wrote it all down. <laughs> it was a good prayer to hear, wasn't it? For all these people who just come back from the mission thinking, oh, they're going to ask, you know, oh, wow, really, one thing, you know, why is it true? Look what we've seen. And the Lord prays, I'm so glad you did these things from all the clever people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> we need to hear that. We need to hear that. It's a double thing about God's revelation. He actually deliberately hides things from all the clever things. <coughs> that explains some of the problems that we have in science at the time, essentially. Particularly on things like evolutionary and creationist theory. I don't know. God hides some things. He hides them. He doesn't tell us everything. And he shows incredible things in little babies. He does, it's good. But he prayed without self-consciousness. It just was there. And he was just so like, thrilled that he just said that moment he didn't pray. Think of what happened before the tomb of Lazarus. Exactly the same. He says, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. <laughs> I, I don't always hear me. I'm just saying that for the benefit of these people around. That's a summary of how he prays. In that chapter of John, you read it. Completely without self-consciousness. I want to pray like that. I want to live my life so that I can just talk to the Father wherever I am in any situation. You don't have to pray out loud. You just don't. Uh, he's there. So I said, no, what difference does it make to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And my answer is simply, for me personally, God's always there. It doesn't matter 
what's happening, where I am, I've just got that constant sense of the presence of God and I can just turn to him and say, Father, I don't have to sort of spend hours trying to prepare my approach. You live in the presence. And that's what it means, that's how Jesus lived. He lived in the presence. One day when Jesus would pray in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. I feel there's a great sigh in that. If you just stood there and you'd seen Jesus pray, what would you have registered? Oh, I don't know, perhaps I've just got a very full imagination and a very full heart, but oh you'd have sensed such a closeness. You'd have sensed such a reality. You'd have discovered that it wasn't the case of using set forms of words, it was just conversation. <laughs> and yet, such a thrilling conversation that Jesus was, oh, well, one day, you know, it was just too much, wasn't it? It was just too much. One day when he was praying, he just shone. <laughs> he was just transfigured just when he was praying. Just, oh, just, just went, really. As if suddenly all the glory of God was just pouring in as he was pouring out his heart on them. It just shone. I mean, that's what it was like anyway, just to see Jesus pray. And they used to watch. They used to watch him praying. And they didn't know how to put it, but you, know, you could just feel the longing in that little phrase, Lord, teach us to pray. How we know it's asking so much. To think that we would just Nobody's good. Pray. As you pray. And they didn't quite know how to put it, and they put that other little phrase on the end, just as John taught his disciples. You know, we know that John taught his disciples to pray. We know that John really was into discipling, and he said to his disciples, when you pray, you say it like this, and you do this, and you do that. And, and they, they wanted Jesus somehow to, to tell them how to pray. It was just they wanted that. But how do you enter into it? When what Jesus is moving in is it's the pure Spirit of God. You know, in those moments when Jesus was praying, you've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just you, you were looking at God in all of His glory. And the one, how can we get in that? And then you come to these words that are so tender of Jesus. When you pray. I love those words. I, they're, 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 they're useless to us in a sense. Because we're so conditioned. We're, we're so taught that one of the great duties of the Christian life is to pray. You know, we get our new Christians, you say, you read this every day, you pray this, and you don't do this, and you do that, and you come to church, and you think, oh. <laughs> and it's all duty. Why don't we put it into a different context? So now look, I don't want to just have to do something fantastic. God's just coming to you the truth. And do pray that God does come into people like that. I remember doing children's events once. And uh, someone said to us, now you must warn the children that they're not actually to expect anything to happen to them when you pray, because you don't want to sort of uh, cause confusion. And uh, I was in the a, a chap I was getting quite close to on that particular children's mission. And I said to him, Let's scrub around that one, shall we? <laughs> we won't bother the time. We'll just, we'll just pray with them and see what happens. And we've got this bunch of 12 minutes to go one day. And I said, you know, do you want to know Jesus? And they said, yeah. I said, right, we'll pray with them. And we'd pray with them. And we didn't say anything. We didn't tell them what to expect. We certainly didn't tell them that nothing had happened. <laughs> and the next day, we got them back and we said, um, oh, you know, how do you feel? What do you want to do? And they said, Oh, well, we'd like to look at the Bible. And we hadn't said to them that, uh, well, you know, Bible study tomorrow, and you know, that, you know. And I said, well, where do you want to look? I said, well, we'd like to start the beginning. We'd like to start in Genesis. I thought, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we were really just trying to see how much the Spirit would lead these kids. You might think we were crazy, but we were very dumb. And, <laughs> and so I said, all right, then we'll, we'll read Genesis. I said, well, you know, let's, let's read this bit. And they, they got on to the bit about the garden of Eden. You know? And I thought, oh, they'll never understand this. 
Because these were kids who weren't from a Christian background at all. And uh, I remember we read a bit about um, the way the Lord speaks to the woman about the serpent. And speaks about the seed that is to come. And of the serpent, you know, it says that that whole business about he will bruise the serpent's head. And yet, that head would bruise the heel. And I thought they didn't have an That is just going to be beyond me. <coughs> so we didn't say anything, but I just turned one of these guys and made it for the day before. I said, What do you think that means? And I remember to this day he gave the clearest explanation of that first time ever heard <laughs> to these other boys. He just got it straight away. He said, Well, that's about Jesus on the cross, isn't it? And that's what Jesus did. He got, he got. Uh, Wounded. I mean, he died for us, but, but obviously what he was doing, he was getting one over on the devil. I thought, oh, that's incredible. <laughs> so it's amazing what God can do. And yet so often we say, now you've got to read so much of this, and you've got to do that. But if we left it to the Holy Spirit much more, who do you think came up with the follow-up program in Acts chapter 2? It's one of my great things I hammered away at during the last Billy Graham mission. I was responsible for the follow-up. And I said, well, who came up with a follow-up program in Acts 2? You know, who said that this is what you've got to do? You've got to devote yourself to the apostles' teaching, breaking the bread, prayer, fellowship. Who you said all that? Who told it? Who came up with a program? It's the Holy Spirit, isn't it?